Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is Laura Ayerge. You probably know me already. I'm a course lead here at MIT CTL uh, for the MIT X MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management program. Very happy to be here today co-hosting this live event once again with Mr. Kellen Betts. Welcome, Kellen. Also a course lead here at the MicroMasters. And today we are really fortunate to have Bhaskar Valapragada joining us. Welcome, Bhaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet, meet everyone. Thank you. We're very, very happy to have you. And uh, we, we are sure our audience is super interested on our topic today. So before going to the agenda for the session, we would like to start the event with a poll just to learn uh, about your expectation here in the audience today. So uh, probably Emma can help us launch a poll. Yeah, there I see it. Great. Uh, so let us know why are you here today? Do you just want to learn more about this machine learning and AI technologies? You want to learn more about the applications on supply chain or the challenges it can bring to apply it? Or probably you're here because you want to start using it and you don't really know where to start from. Uh, so while we let that populate, and thank you because I see a lot of answers already, um, I'll let, uh, I give the floor to Kellen for the agenda for the session. Awesome. Well, thank you, Laura, and hi, everyone. So for the next 20 minutes or so, Bhaskar is going to discuss some of the complex challenges supply chain managers face when using traditional planning techniques um, due to the interactions between upstream and downstream supply chain entities, such as suppliers, customers. Um, he'll then discuss new machine learning, ML, and AI techniques to handle these complex interactions, focusing on a few use cases, exciting use cases, demand sensing primarily and production optimization. I think we'll look at those two use cases maybe. And also touch on some future applications of AI. You know, we've all heard AI in the news a lot lately. And so these large language models like ChatGPT, um, and then discuss decision chaining and generative AI, also another hot topic in the news as well. And um, we'll follow up Bhaskar's presentation with a few prepared questions, and we'll dive into kind of some of these topics a little bit more deeply. And then we'll definitely save the last 15 minutes or so for your questions from the audience. And so start thinking of those as we get started here. And please use the webinar Q&A feature, that Q&A button there in Zoom to ask those questions. We'd love to see the introductions in, in chat, in the chat, but please use the Q&A feature for the, the, your questions so we can keep track of those. And make sure you're logged in with a name so we won't be picking questions from anonymous um, users. And we'll also have a couple more polls as we go along, so be prepared to participate in those as well. Awesome, so maybe if we could check on the our first uh, poll results here. Maybe, in the poll and share the results. Um, so the question was, why are you here today? Um, it looks like you know definitely the majority here are here to learn about um, the use of ML and AI technologies and supply chains in general. That's that's great. You know we're going to dive into some of these topics as well, but these are a big topic, and so hopefully we'll hit that high level, general high level as well. Um, Basque, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on those poll results there. No, this 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 makes complete sense, and the people are in general interested in in understanding you know how. ML and AI can be applied to supply chain. Uh, they've seen the applications all over the place, but you know, very specifically interested in the in the supply chain domain. Awesome. So thank you for participating in our first poll. Um, love to see those MicroMaster learners there who don't miss any of our live events. Love to see you. So welcome. Um, thanks for joining us again. Um, so with that, let's kick things off. I don't know if you maybe would just to start things off, you could just share just for a few minutes a little bit back about your background. Um, kind of the story and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. So thank you. Um, thanks, Kellen and, and Laura. And, and um, you know, glad to share some of my learnings um, in, the, in the supply chain space. So I'm I'm based in 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 um, beautiful rainy Seattle. Um, my as a way of background, I am a chemical environmental engineer. That's kind of where where I got my training in or my degree in. Uh, post my PhD out of uh, University of Washington, you know, I spent the the initial uh, years just doing nuts and bolts engineering, um, uh, you know, designing uh, wastewater treatment plants, you know, sizing pumps, valves, fittings, um, you know, writing operations manuals, um, and then wearing a hard hat and 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 walking the shop floor. Um, so, but after the first few years, majority of my career, though, I spent in the digital marketing space. Completely different, but you know, uh, something that is very uh, data intensive, um, and, and and that's where I I spent my time 
building out large scale platforms, um, and but also spend time in product as well as uh, running running uh, a few different profitable businesses. More recently, about 2018, I joined Throughput um, as the chief technology architect, just kind of building out their platforms, kind of bringing together some of the the engineering and the um, uh, and the um, and the data analytics knowledge you know, to supply chain. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's inspiring for many people in our audience. We get a lot of questions and what about switching at, in the middle of my career to a different path and how to do that and whether it makes sense or not. So I think uh, we are also going to learn a lot from that part of your uh, discussion. Um, so I think we're ready to jump into your presentation just to kick things off. Uh, so you're welcome to start sharing and take us with you in this journey. So this is a a, a supply chain schematic that that most people have seen, uh, you know, one time or the other. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Supply chain is about taking the uh, transporting and transforming all of the the raw materials into the um, uh, into finished goods into the hands of the consumers, right? And so, of course, there are a whole bunch of steps involved um, along the way, as everyone is aware of. When you look at the schematic. And you know, this looks fairly simple and straightforward, right? um, up until you know you see what's happening in the in the real world. And uh, you know this is a Sankey view of one of a, one of the vertically integrated operations that uh, uh, that we worked with. And you see that you know there is there is a whole bunch of nodes you know from suppliers to production to warehouses uh, to point of sale customers, and they're all interconnected. And then you see the flows going you know between them. The, the challenge that ends up happening is is that you know for at each of the nodes it's a it's a many to many relationship so you have multiple suppliers taking to you know sending the sending their raw materials to to multiple plants plants accepting those uh, you know working with multiple suppliers you know having production systems you know bill of materials etc and that's kind of what makes it complex right um if just overlaying the same data on a on a on a map view, Again, you know, it just looks a mishmash of uh, of flows from from uh, one location to another. So, how do you go about, you know, managing such a such a complex network? Right? And so, when we when we talk to talk to supply chain managers or professionals, you know, the, the primary things that that come to their mind is, look, you know, I'm I'm looking to just meet my customer demand, or you know, manage profitability by by reducing the cost. Or of increasing the operational efficiency of my of my, my production systems, but, and and overall just trying to reduce the reduce the lead times of the of the chain. In many cases, you know the way they 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 do it is you know they will have typically some sort of a business intelligence system, right? Whether it's a Power BI, Tableau, um, uh, you know, Click, or, or other several others, and um, and and they'll have some visualizations. But as you know. The BI just use visual charts and line graphs, and it doesn't really provide you with with the necessary insights or the recommendations or the decisions. And that's left up to the analyst or the operator to figure it out. And so the question always comes: Well, how do we how do we take it to the next step? And the next step is 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 really you know building out an end to end solution. But along the way, there are several challenges, right? And the, and the challenges primarily relate to uh, availability and access to data. Right? Now, in most organizations, if you if if you if you look at look at their data infrastructure, um, well, they'll have an ERP to manage their system. The challenge is not having an ERP. What they do is they have multiple ERPs. Um, you know, and for a variety of reasons, you know, because of mergers and acquisitions, or they have different uh, siloed um, siloed businesses, which makes it difficult. The same thing is that they're constantly working with third parties, so having access to the data. Um, the uh, the quality and the consistency and integrity of the data. I mean, you have all of those things, and the, the the final aspect in terms of moving from BI to some sort of an ML solution is is the necessary, necessary budget and the allocation that that is associated with the ROI that you have to sell to your CFO. Right? So all of these essentially end up, you know, forcing you know the organization to say, okay, you know what, if you want to apply. ML, if you want to solve some supply chain problems, you know, let's, let's, and, and if you have these data challenges, let's go with some, with simpler uh, point-based solutions. 
And that's kind of what ends up happening in the, in the marketplace, right? So what you end up seeing is solutions that have built around you know, one of the nodes. You know, the nodes I talked about, supplier, customer, warehouses, production, et cetera. And so, for example, for customers and suppliers, You'll have you'll have a um, you know we'll, we'll do things such as customer segmentation, ranking, um, you know some level of cross sell upsell, uh, churn analysis uh, for inventory. You know there are standard uh, inventory recommendation uh, modules or solutions that are built out for demand. You know, the standard ones that come to mind in terms of solutions is is rationalization, you know forecasting, etc. Uh, for distribution networks and for and production, you know some type of a linear programming optimization uh, solution that, that, that happens. And so these are kind of the standard solutions that, that people implement um, and the algorithms and the algorithms, you know, end up being a whole host of them, right? Starting from, you know, just rule-based segmentation, RFM analysis for uh, for customer segmentation to, uh, you know, OR, OR tools uh, or linear optimization tools, vehicle routing tools for, for handling, you know, distribution and production. To uh, you know, some of the the time series models for forecasting, whether it is Arima, Sarima, or or or, or, or several others um, that, that I will talk about, um, and you know, and some linear regression, some some type of regression analysis, um, you know, for to handle uh, recommendations. So, for example, you know, uh, people want to do cross sell, upsell, they will use collaborative filtering. Uh, you know, it's something that. Uh, uh, you know that has become popular with, you know, with the recommendation engines. Right? So these are kind of the some of the standard techniques that are currently used. Um, I just want to talk briefly about a couple of use cases that um, uh, you know we had worked on and have had experience with. Um, you know during the you know, during during the course. Um, the first one centers around a a, um, a grocery store you know based out of um, uh, based out of Europe. And this is a fairly large, uh, large chain, um, you know, having about fifty thousand SKUs, multiple uh, uh, distribution centers, and, and retail outlets. Um, with with the supermarket chain, one of the challenges, of course, is is the shelf life and the wastage. Right? And you have, um, you know, if as soon as the as product expires, you end up having to and to throw it out or or dispose it off or sell it at a at a, at a much lower price. Um, in order to understand demand forecasting aspect of, 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 of all of their SKUs really, and there's 50,000 SKUs. And what I'm gonna show you is, is an example of, of a, a, a single SKU. It happened to be a meat product. Um, at the top, you know, um, uh, you see a, um, a, uh, a, a timeline view of the demand profile. And so the, the, the blue bars at the top, top of the graph essentially are, are the sales. And the and the yellow line that you see on top of it is the is the model predictions. Right, um, the bottom graph is also the demand graph, except except we have applied some statistical techniques to identify some of the outliers or or, or um, and 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 flag them. So and, and so you see, uh, you know, so the, the few things that that you observe right away. So number one is overall, you know, visually the model seems to work very well, you know, right off the bat. Second, you know, you had long periods of, of low demand, you know, with, with some spikes in between. Um, there was weekly, weekly impact on the, on, on the demand. So for example, and then we saw Sundays were low, Saturdays were high, et cetera. But overall the, 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 the levels were low with some, some time periods that the, the, of high. Now, when we try to model this using standard ARIMA, uh, sorry, ARIMA type uh, time series models, it didn't work very well. And that's primarily because you know these these peaks essentially were you know were not seasonal, um, and so so then you know the, the next thing that came up was what is it that that is affecting the the um, you know the the spikes in the demand during those time periods. Luckily, we had information from the uh, you know the, uh, from the uh, the company that we work for on the promotional campaigns that they are running, and so I kind of listed out. The, the three primary campaigns. The, one of them was price reduction. Second one was offering discounts and they had different levels of discounts. And the third one was, was just offering loyalty points uh, you know, when, uh, when somebody bought items. Um, once you overlay this information on top of the, of the, of the demand graph and the sales graph, you see right away that both P1 and P3, which is price reduction and, and, and the points 
not have a whole lot of impact or didn't have much impact. Whereas the, the P2, which was the discounting, had a significant impact. And in fact, you know, we were able to take that information or the model was able to take the information and, and essentially future predict it. So, you know, as you know, when they realized that, hey, you know what, we are we are stocking up our inventory and you want to get rid of it, they could essentially apply those, those discounts. Right? And they were able to do it for multiple SKUs and be able to manage their both their wastage as well as the uh, as the as the inventory levels for the uh, uh, you know for 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 multiple products. The second use case I want to talk about is centers around um, uh, production. Now, in this this particular use case, essentially dealt with plastics bottle uh, uh, manufacturing. Now, you know, it's a the the the, the plastic bottle manufacturing is a fairly straightforward and simple process in terms of you know. Um, in terms of you know you essentially have a, a injection molding machine and you you push push some raw material through it and and you know and and, and, and out comes out comes the the, the end product um, the the top left uh, graph here essentially shows the the uh, the uh, the various processes that were essentially set up for the most part in parallel um, the challenge that they were having though was around um, it was twofold the first was that the, the demand was very seasonal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and essentially they saw a high demand during 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 the June to July time frame and the rest was was much much lower. Um, the second thing was that they felt that they were capacity constrained. So their the, the their way of handling the the solution was you know you essentially build up the inventory up until the up until the peak arrives and then you you know end up drawing down right? which kind of makes sense to a certain degree. Except you know, having such high inventory levels essentially costs, you know, there's a huge amount of carrying costs involved, not to mention that you know the limitation in the space, et cetera. Also, having having uh, a, a huge uh, uh, you know not being able to fulfill some of the demand essentially meant that they, they were losing on some of the some of the sales. And so the question always was, hey, should we be buying more machines? Um, I'm going to go through the next few charts, and they and it is a little busy in terms of the um, in terms of data. But I do want to highlight a few things because this is what goes into um, analysis or and uh, figuring out how to apply some of the some of the models. So when you look at uh, machine operation or process operation in a production setting, um, there are kind of three key parameters that that you look at. It's the it's the defect rate. Um, the cycle time, which is you know, cycle time is how fast you're producing the product, or, or the flow flow rate is the, the um, is the how fast you're producing. Cycle time is inverse of that, and uptime or downtime, how 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 much the machine is up or down. Right? All of them three combine to um, uh, to form the OE or the overall equipment um, effectiveness. Right? And this is something that the the, the operators are, are are judged on, are bonused on, or incented on. Right. So there's there, there's a Huge incentive for them to keep this thing up and and, um, and moving. But if you looked, so I'm going to focus on one aspect of it because that's the one that we ended up using. And I'll, I'll go through the rationale behind it. Uh, but we looked at the the, mach- the machines, and we are calling calling them processes here. Now each machine is able to produce multiple multiple products. Um, the key aspect of it is that even though they were all rated the same to produce certain products. You know, what we observed was that certain machines would produce certain products at a, at a higher rate than the others, and which was a which was a big deal because now once you know that information, you can actually go ahead and 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 and, and figure out how you want to optimize the um, optimize the, the the system. Second, that we looked at is like you know kind of highlighted the the three elements right the um, the uh, uh, uptime, the the cycle time. And the defect, and so we looked at um, categorizing those. And this is a waterfall chart, and let me explain this a little bit. And the waterfall chart essentially shows, uh, you know, how many units were produced during this time period, and the losses that occurred, that were estimated losses, you know, from various operations. And so what we noticed is that, and so when you made me categorize the, the losses along with what the production, so there was about seventy eight percent loss associated with with various. Various parts of the system. Um, you have the uptime losses, you have the flow or the cycle time losses, and then you have the defect rate or the yield losses. As you can see right off the bat, you know the the uptime or downtime losses were not significant, and neither were the yield defect losses, um, whereas the flow flow losses are significant. So that's kind of where we ended up 
uh, you know, focusing our energy. Now, if you if you hear, for example, of predictive maintenance, this is kind of what this thing affects. And right? if you're if you look at trying to trying to fix some of your defect or, or quality problems, this is what 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 um, uh, part of the production system it affects. You know what we found out was that the the flow losses are much higher, right? and so we kind of use that information, right? Use that information in a um, in a multiple integer programming or linear uh, linear optimization model to to set it up. You know where where we obviously looked at at different horizon time scale horizons or primarily variable. Or what we are trying to find out was hey, how many units are produced per product per resource per time period. That is what we were trying to try and identify and find out. And of course, there are constraints that we needed to meet the demand. You know, you need to keep the, the capacity utilization below a certain point. And, and we had the data associated from um, you know uh, on, on the on the flow cycle. And this is the operations data that we, and the and the and the, and the, the objective really was to a maximize the profit and or increase the capacity. Right? The end result, though, the output of it is essentially a map, a map that shows for a given time period. How do you want to allocate your resources? Right? Um, uh, you know which machines should produce uh, which product and at what rate, and and we were able to provide with with, a, with recommendations associated with that. And the end result really was increase in 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 in, uh, in capacity utilization, and and they were able to reduce the inventory uh, significantly. You know from uh, you know how much they had to store before. You know to to what they were able to do. So this is all great, and as as I explained, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, solutions uh, end up being point solutions. You know, addressing a certain part of the supply chain. Really, we want to, you know, we want what people are looking for is to be able to solve some of the more complex uh, challenges that that we face. And so, if you if you start looking at some of the future facing ML AI, uh, you have to talk about the large language models, right? I mean, those are kind of the uh, thing that's um, that's topical. Uh, and then I want to talk about a few other things in addition to that. Again, as, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, if, if you have, if you're talking about AI, uh, uh, Chad GPT has kind of brought the, the LLMs, or the large language models to the, to the fore. Now, if you just put in, put in the, put in the sentence, hey, what are large language models in open AI? You know, what do you, what do you, what, do you, what it comes back is, you know, they are also known as LLMs. They are, AI models designed to understand and generate human-like text based on the patterns and, and information that they learned from vast amounts of text data. Now, I would suspect, you know, majority of the folks, you know, um, that are listening in have already used. Um, I would be surprised if nobody has used an OpenAI or a or a BART or, or other type of LLM, you know, putting in a prompt and getting some responses back. So, you know, that is something that's accepted. But what people are really interested in knowing is, well, okay, you know, how do I use this in my daily work? Right? How do I use this in my supply chain domain? So one thing that um, you know the, that 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 people want to know is to be able to query their their own data. Mm -hmm. So that 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 is a uh, that is something that comes up often, um, and 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 there are already solutions that are out there from from the, from the major players. You know, you can take the documents. Essentially, you know, and, and those documents can be um, you know, just PDFs, reports, but they can be also whole databases, you know, CSV files, etc. You know, load them into the um, uh, load them using APIs into the um, again into OpenAI, Bard, or, or or other solutions, and and what ends up happening is that you know the the, the documents are then are then um, uh, vectorized and uh, and converted into embeddings. Right. And so it's essentially it's a vector representation of the of the documents. And once once that's done, then then the next thing you do is you run a similarity search, and the similarity search essentially returns the, the all the relevant documents, and then you use that as a context, you know, to to be able to query it. Yeah. Fairly simple, and 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 you can use you you can use this for asking the standard questions of your of your supply chain. Hey, what are the you know what are what are the revenue of my top three products, or you know what is the you know who was the customer that that um, you know um, you know went you know that that we lost last year or, or last quarter, or items that need to be ordered. So, so so all the standard questions can be can be done. One of the challenges that 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 people are uh, do not want to do is essentially are, are concerned about is putting their own documents 
in directly into under the cloud and, and 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 to be indexed that that is again a common problem and there are local local LLMs that are that are, that are coming up too that that will allow you to to just through that but on on your own on your own local network but that's not what what you know people want to go beyond just asking questions of your data right they want they want you to be how do you want to be able to make decisions out of them or or or, or take you to the next level and and this is where and so you know when you look at a, a decision making process you know it is it it involves um kind of multiple steps um and so all decisions you know you first ask a question you query query some data you get some recommendations then you go to the next and ask a, a next set of questions etc so it's a it's a decision chain and fortunately there are frameworks that are being built open source frameworks such as langchain that uh, just allow us to do that, right? They allow us to essentially interact with the LLMs, uh, get some response back, apply it to some real world situations, whether it is, you know, just doing a web search to looking at your data, make those decisions and follow up to the next step, you know? And so it is a it is a chain that can be fully built out and, and done, you know, purely by data. And so a lot of these things can be done through rule-based um, or, or logic-based systems but being able to do it purely based on data is something that that then this thing allows it to do. So you know, a, a use case would be something sim uh, simple as okay, you know, what do you want to fill a customer order? You know, we can write a write a whole program to be able to do it, or we can essentially you know put that into the into our intelligent agent. The intelligent agent essentially will take that question, go to the LLM, figure out you know what data it needs, what calculations it needs to make, do that, and come up with recommendations. No, so in this case, you know, it'll be okay. You know what? I want to fill the order. So it's going to first check, you know, hey, when is this third due, and what is the quantity required? Then, then next, it'll go in and check whether whether the stock is is available. If not, it'll go in, in, and create a production order. Um, and you know, or if it's not, it's create a production. If it's if it's available, it'll, it'll schedule and delivery. And so all of that thing can be can be can be done using data, uh, you know, or training with training data as opposed to to uh, rule based and finally you know so this is something again the neural networks or, or deep learning is is something that has been around for for a few years except the potential is just coming to light uh, more recently right? again again because of chat gpt and, and few others so traditionally um, a neural network which essentially is a is a network of nodes you know which contains your uh, input layer where you where you essentially push in your uh, training data and and bunch of hidden layers, you know, where where some of the, the calculations and transformations are made, an output layer where where where, it, where the, the the end result comes out. Uh, that has been used primarily for things such as image recognition, uh, uh, natural language processing, and and speech recognition and things like that. You know, however, again, what what people thought before was they that the that the results were limited to those types of of um, uh, uh, of solutions. Um, again, large language models just change that. It, it just kind of, more importantly, it, it allowed, it told us what what else can is possible with with these things. And then finally, you know, of course, the you know the, the autonomous driving, you know, which is which is taking off. So what is you know see with with neural networks, the the the, uh, the while the results are there, the the um, it, it does require a large data set. You know, as as kind of highlighted by some of these. Um, uh, so these are lamps and 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 huge amount of compute, but the potential is there. The question then again becomes, hey, how do you apply it to supply chain domain? And and the, and this is where we you know we talked about data fragmentation, etc. And and so there is a there is a concept of of simulated data. And so you know, what you can do is there is already some data available, and again it varies depending on the depending on the um, uh, on the type of organization. Uh, but but there are some large organizations have 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 significant amount of data, and you layer in some simulations on top of it. You can actually uh, build enough of a of a training data set, then that you can build neural nets that can solve some of these complex challenges. Let me stop there and see if um, if there are any questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Vaskar. Um, I think we learned a lot, and I also found very interesting to see the use cases because you brought all the layers of complexity that we can see in a supply chain all together. Like it's not we usually just learn about optimization or only about inventory and all separated, like demand sensing, as you said. Um, but here we got them all together and in 
identifying one single problem that covers all of them and with the trade-off of cost and time. And it's great to see how technology can help us on those use cases. So thank you for bringing those to the, to the floor today. Um, I was thinking on the challenges and you touch upon a little bit on that uh, a few minutes ago. Um, you talked about fragmented data, but you also talk about the access to data being a challenge. And then, of course, having silo data in different ERPs and all. And, and I've seen that in many companies. And so I, I totally see see the point of that being a challenge. Um, I was wondering if, as we need a, a huge amount of data, massive amount of data to train some models, like GPT are, is using like much of the internet information to, to be trained. Okay. Can you share us more about the strategies that, uh, or how do you approach facing that challenge of accessing to data and having the right data for what we need. You mentioned something about simulations, uh, but wanted to know more about how to make it massive when we need it massive. No, absolutely. You know, all, all, all important challenges. In fact, you know, we say, you know, 80% of the work is actually in the data preparation and then 20% is, is in the, uh, you know, in the analysis and, and, and running the, um, running the models. So let me let me start by saying so the talk about the fragmentation right, of the data. So what what we have seen is as I said you know many times people or, or companies have ERPs. The challenge ends up being that they have multiple multiple ERPs. And so for example, it might be a domain domain based on domain. So for example, you, know, you have um, a company that that wants to use you know one particular ERP. To handle their their um, their demand and inventory, or their sales sales orders and inventory, or or, or even the finance. Uh, another one uh, for their transportation uh, data set, right, or distribution. Um, and then you know, and then you know, production is a completely different ball game because you know you need manufacturing execution systems for that. So the EMEA system. So so right there, and if you have if you have enough part of the businesses, you know, you will end up having multiple, multiple ERPs, you know, that's, that's almost a given, but also it's because, uh, you know, internal decision-making, right? And so many times, you know, you have siloed parts of the organization, you will have, um, you know, different businesses with, with different um, uh, reasons they want certain ERPs. And so you will see, uh, you know, fragmentation or multiple ERPs because of that. Finally, you have a situation of mergers and acquisitions, right? you know, more and more, Two companies never have the same ERP, and when you acquire a company, you are going to inherit and um, inherit that. And now, you know, people will say that you know we can we can transform it, but that's a much longer process. So that's the that that's the data fragmentation, and then the access to data is is tied to third parties, and so inevitably you end up working with suppliers, um, third party logistic providers, uh, you know, fulfillment centers. Uh, all of them have their own systems, um, and so it's and they may not want to share the data because because the data set essentially contains information about some other uh, players, or they may also um, they may just not have the capabilities of doing it, or they may not they you know they just wouldn't want to share it for for comparative reasons and other other reasons because you know you know typically people end up charging more or you know there might be some pricing information that is that is that is built in there, so people don't want to share that. So in terms of, and then of course there's a, there, there are other challenges with data volume, data, you know. So you know we have seen the same product being called two different things, and uh, you know different two different periods, etc. Right. So we see a, a lot of challenges like that. Um, in terms of in terms of how you address this, um, so the data fragmentation is while it is a problem with supply chain, you know it is something that has been, uh, you know there there is fair amount of tools that are available. Nowadays, um, you know, so you have you have open source tools such as Airflow, Daxters that help you with the pipelining. Uh, uh, you know, all of the all of the major players, you know, they have um, data stitching, data gluing tools. While the data sets are fragmented, and, and typically when you say fragmented, not only is that is that is the um, the form is the is the structure different, but also how it's rendered. So some might might be CSV files. Some are, you know, if you're connecting using the uh, API it might be some sort of a JSON format, and even the JSON formats are different for different different ERPs, right? So, but there are solutions that that, that help you with that with that with that pipeline process. And I can, of course, uh, you know, go into detail of of you know, you know what they can do. But that's a that's a I would say a, a reasonably well solved problem. 
It doesn't necessarily mean it's easy, but it can be can be done. The, the, the next challenge that comes in is again the same. Multiple ERPs have different ways of dealing with the with the same information. For the, the, the for example, you talk about sales order. If you look at a you know, ERP one, it'll have a, a, a particular type of uh, table structure, and the second one will have a, a different type, right? So the way the, the way to to handle is to is to just like just like we you know to uh, look and you know, solve the demand sensing problem, identify the 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 the, the metrics and the parameters that are that are absolutely needed and impactful. And so those end up being, of course, you know, you want timestamp, right? So you know these are they're very specific in terms of you know what you're trying to solve. Timestamp, you need how much quantity was ordered, how much quantity was delivered. Uh, you know what the, you know what are the what are the 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 key nodes in the element. So you can distill down and and standardize some of those things. Um, you may miss a few parts, but but you you know if you can focus on those standardized elements, then you can you can transform the data much much easily from a mapping perspective. In terms of um, in terms of the um, the data data volume, right? And and there is there is a significant difference now. Just for just for comparison's sake, I believe in and you know GPT two you know it's a, it's a one point five billion uh, parameter model and you know it uses about forty GB of data. Right? Um, you know GPT three was about one hundred seventy five billion. You know that's um, um, and it uses forty five terabytes of data. And the GPT four I believe is 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 close to one point seven trillion. So it's a it's an order of magnitude. And uses you know closer to one petabyte or or, or more of, of data, right? So it's a, it is a significant volume. Now, and and in, in comparison, in comparison, if you if you look at some of the um, uh, uh, the data sets that are available in, in the supply chain space, uh, they're transaction based. Depending on the scale of the business, you know they can range anywhere from you know hundreds of megabytes or gigabyte to to um, you know ten or hundreds of terabytes, unless until you go to the the, you know, the the top five, the top 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 uh, top ten uh, Fortune 500 company or Fortune companies to be able to get the, those volumes, right? So the 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 other aspect, which is which is kind of um, pushed by, for example, AlphaGo, is to essentially do simulation and and build up the data set. Right? So that's how you solve the problem. I know it was a long winded answer, but but you know it is it is a it is a huge problem. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bhaskar. I know it's a problem that many of us have probably experienced in different. Um, capacities. It's good to know that there are now tools, at least for the the gluing together data and the pipelining of the data. There's a, there's now a lot of robust tools that are available. Um, it's also interesting to hear you, you see you mentioned you also kind of tied this to the demand sensing um, topic, which I also may want to dive into maybe a little bit deeper. Where in some cases maybe you just want to focus in on the specific parameters or specific pieces that you're interested in, and not necessarily absorb the whole volume of data because maybe you don't need it all. Um, and so maybe just kind of building on that and then also focusing on that demand sensing um, example that you brought up earlier. And can you contrast that with time series models? Which time series models, you obviously you're just kind of fitting a model to that transactional historical data in some sense. I um, mean, the demand sensing use case you brought in, you actually bring in this other element of data, which is the promotional calendar. And so yeah. I'm wondering what that from just from like an algorithm machine learning perspective, how that looks different. You know, obviously it's very different than just fitting a model to transaction data. So how, what does the, the machine learning side of that look like um, from the demand? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, it ends up being a fitting <laughs> fitting a model too, except, um, you know, so so when we when we look at look at um, the data, uh, when, when you're, you know, we use, use forecasting and, and sensing for kind of two two different uh, aspects one is is um, on, on the demand side uh, and to a certain degree on the lead time right? uh, so the, two, the kind of two aspects of um, forecasting that we use in terms of the of the of the, of the demand profile you know when, when you're looking at looking at whether selling a good or services it typically follows a a, a you know some sort of a pattern right so then it's a, you have a, a a daily you know hourly pattern you have a weekly pattern, you know, in terms of um, certain days being higher than less, a seasonal seasonal pattern. But what we have also seen is that um, that's just not enough. Right? There are a lot of other interactions that end up happening that kind of end up changing the uh, the demand profile. Uh, very specifically, uh, uh, you know, we talked about promotions, but we have seen other use cases. You know, so for example, there was a cement manufacturing company that we were work working with. 
Uh, now, for example, for, for cement and concrete, the, the dependence on the demand is based on, on political cycles, right? um, in, in especially in, in, in some countries. Um, you know, so you know, right before the elections, you know, uh, you will end up seeing a, a jump in the in the in the concrete usage or the cement usage, and demand goes up. So you have to build that in. So there are there are, there are, there are things such as those that end up playing a role. So you always have to bring you know, some sort of a third third data set. Now, if I look at uh, into into in, you know to be able to, and then you know then of course you know you're talking about interactions, you know, art substitute products, art net products, and, and all those things. There's there's a whole bunch of interactions that end up happening that technically just a unimediate solution you know, is, is, cannot handle all of them. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you look at time series forecasting, there's kind of like, kind of put them into three buckets. You know, you have the the tradi traditional autoregressive uh, moving average, you know, Arima, Sarima type, type, um, type models. Um, you have the the um, you know additive regressive models you know some uh, like profit which is kind of what we ended up using in this particular case, um, or you can do use neural networks whether it is uh, you know recurrent neural networks or LSTM type um, type networks to be able to to, to be able to model them. Um, so again, you know, we tried with Arima Sarima and, and and didn't work primarily because of these exogenous variables. Um, there is Sarima X, which includes the the, uh, the exogenous variables, but it, you know the for us you know the, the the additive model was just easier easier to implement, and that's kind of what we went with. Uh, we have not tried the 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 RNNs or recurrent neural neural networks for this, but when you're looking for interactions between various various products, I think that's probably something that you know uh, we, we need to look into. Thanks, Bhaskar. And we have so many questions in the Q&A feature, so we appreciate the interest of the audience. I don't think we'll get to every question, but we will try to cover most of the topics. Thanks, everyone, for that. So, Bhaskar, I I was impressed with all you shared about the interactions, and I went back to some common discussions we have in the supply chain. You've covered seasonality, um, but there's also the possibility of outliers, and you briefly touch upon predictive techniques for identifying outliers. Um, I'm very interested on that because we often deal with black swan kind of events, big disruption, could be natural disasters, and those may be actually affecting our data as outliers. And I've heard of how different ERPs will be dealing different with outliers when bringing the data to you and how much manual work sometimes we have to put into it to find those outliers. I was wondering, based on your experience, was what's the best approach to deal with them, but also if the different tools we have in machine learning and AI applications will bring us different type of results and whether we must go to one or the other based on what we're looking for. Sure, sure. My answer might be simpler than, <laughs> simpler than that, but but let me kind of uh, you know uh, uh, kind of set up the problem a little bit. In most cases, as I said, you know, there are there are a lot of interactions that end up happening within the supply chain. But in addition to that, what ends up happening is that most people are optimizing, you know, their own node, if you may. Right? Suppliers are look, trying to pro, you know maximize their profits. Production systems are are um, are designed to to be as efficient as possible. Um, you know, the same thing with with the, the traffic systems. Right? They are they are designed to um, they are designed to essentially get you know maximize the utilization of their trucks, maximize the utilization of their um, uh, of their drivers, et cetera. Right? So it is it is operating extremely efficiently. Each of the nodes is operating extremely efficiently, uh, and it works very well, right? Because you get a lot of things in time, except when there is a disruption or when there is a when there is a a a, a black swan event that you're kind of not not expecting. Yeah. And that happens essentially kind of all, all hell breaks loose, right? Now you have, you essentially have delays across the board. And when, when those delays happen at each of the node, essentially, you know, people go the other way and they start ordering more and they, you know, so it's a cascading effect that, that essentially results in not just, not just, uh, you know, uh, creating those, those constraints or bottlenecks, but you know it takes much longer to to come back to the normal. You know, which kind of what we have seen. And so, and and, and so the one of the solutions, and, and and this is kind of what Lean teaches us. Lean teaches us to be as efficient as possible, just in time, etc. Right. Um, but there is a 
you know, there is a price to pay for it, and and it's essentially the black swan events. One suggestion is to is to is to think, you know, when you're when you're operating a a, a supply chain business is to is to think about some of the TOC concept or theory of constraint concepts, right? Because what they end up doing is that um, they they help you identify the constraints in your system and kind of manage things around it. Um, so you so so you're not necessarily operating everything at hundred percent efficiency, but but it it really doesn't matter because you know if you operate operate something that at the highest efficiency it may not essentially get you the, the the end result right so that's one way of doing it but also you know in addition to that you want to have all the flexibilities possible within the system in you know, a sufficient supplies etc the thing that i would say in terms of ml and ai though is from a scenario planning perspective is that that's what it allows you to do is that ml and ai would allow, allow you to build the, these different types of scenarios that 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 you can then 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 go to to, to figure out how to best handle you know in the black swan events Awesome. Thank you, Baskar. It's very interesting to hear the idea of kind of bringing together some more classical concepts like theory of constraints um, with some of these more modern concepts like AI. I know the goal, you know, Goal Rat's book is definitely influential in my earlier, earlier career. And so that's interesting to see that that tied into some of these newer concepts. Um, awesome. So in the interest of time, I know we're kind of running short on time here. So maybe if we could launch our third poll and then we're going to just maybe just jump in here to the, the audience Q&A. And we have a bunch of questions, so definitely appreciate you jumping in there with your questions, and we'll probably try to you know group some of these because I know there's a couple of questions here around similar topics. Uh, and maybe so while you're doing that, the first, our third poll here. Um, what was the most interesting part of today's session for you? We'd love to hear your feedback. You know, maybe it was just expanding your knowledge in ML and AI generally. Uh, maybe it was the specific applications of these in supply chains. So love to hear your feedback there. Um, and while you do that, maybe the first question I wanted to jump into is just diving into this idea that you mentioned of decision chaining. Um, one of the questions um, we have here was the difference between decision chaining and what he called hyper autom automation. So I don't know if you, this is Tarun, I don't know if you're familiar with that concept. And then another question to kind of tie these together here is just if you could speak a little bit more on how this intelligent agent in this decision chaining process works. This is from John Coffey here, um, how that agent in, that, in this decision chaining um, process works, like how you train the agent or what, it look, what that agent looked like. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, I believe the first question was around, uh, both of the questions were around decision chaining, you know, versus the um, the the hyper automation. Um, you know, if if I if I understand uh, correctly, the hyper automation, you know, still requires, uh, you know, some level of coding, right? Uh, some level of um, uh, rule based. Uh, inputs into the system, right? Uh, and what we are talking about is not doing that, but having a system that actually learns, and right? It learns from the data to be able to make, you know, to make those, make those next set of decisions. Uh, the, 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 the decision chaining essentially is, is again, kind of refer you to the open source project line chain for it, but, but the, the concept is, is, is that the LLMs allow you to converse um, with the data and be able to uh, extract information, um, but but that's all it does, right? So you need other things to be able to do it, and so along with that, the, there is a concept called as agents or tools within the uh, you know within within the framework, and what that does is so for example in the LLMs, it's a static model, you know it has been you know you know it has been um, trained over the last I don't know um, you know several years, but it stops at a certain point, right? So then, then you want to be able to use the most latest information. So there's a concept of agent that, that can first, the LLMs can transpose that information in terms of what you're asking into, into actions. And if that requires going and just, just using an example, checking specific traffic pattern or checking you know, what the current situation is, the, 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 the associated agent can go and actually do it. Or, if it needs to make an intelligent math calculation, not something that has been pre-built, right? So you, know, you can you can obviously write write code to figure out you know a specific mathematical operation to do, but if if you want the the system to figure out which mathematical operation to 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 uh, to go and do, um, you know, uh, feeding that in, into the into the uh, uh, into that agent will allow you to do that. And the way really it works is that when 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 people build these agents. 
you know, they essentially list out all of the things that you can do in their description. And that's how it kind of uses LLM to figure out you know, which, which particular agent to use and go to the next step. So I hope I answered that question, but I, you know, I, would, I would refer, refer um, uh, uh, the, the person who asked, I believe it's Tarun, to, to, to check out some of those, those frameworks. Thanks, Baskar. Uh, I'm wondering about, and I'm also bringing some questions from the audience because probably the first approach most of people had to uh, machine learning or AI was, as you said, playing with open AI and having their questions and prompts. Um, so when we train our models and we have our tools, we know what we're fitting into those models. We know what's the data, what are the problems with our data, what are our assumptions? But we're, when we're working with OpenAI or any other similar tool, um, Philip, for example, is bringing here that he has the concern on the lack of references. Because in the past, we would do all the search and come up to a result based on some sources we trust um, or we think could be accurate. But when there's this AI doing those that work for us and filtering and selecting our response, we don't have those references. What would be your recommendation for those that are starting with being in touch with AI and using it for making decisions for their company in terms of the accuracy of the information provided? Yeah, no, so absolutely. That those are some of the challenges, right? Is that you know you don't um, list out the references now. Now, when you load the documents, your own documents into the system, and so I'm talking about um, you know not specifically um, the the tools that are online. But when you load your own documents, so let's just say that I want to ask a question, so I want to make a decision uh, based on a question. Um, you can actually, when you once you load the doc document into the system and it indexes it, when it comes back with the answer, you know, if you if you if you try to ask, hey, explain me how you came back with the answer, it will actually list the documents associated with it, right? So it'll tell you the context it used to be able to calculate that. So that's a, that's one way of kind of providing, you know, getting to that. And those those kinds of things, right? Whether it is dealing with, with some of the security issues and people have a lot of security issues being able to upload the data, right? Coming up with um, issues that surround, um, you know, with, uh, with addressing certain uh, specific use cases, uh, you can train the model to do it, and you can you can have it give you the information or, and list out exactly how it came up with with that assessment. So hopefully that helps. Awesome, thank you, Baskar. So maybe if we could just take a quick peek at the our poll number three results here. Um, again, the question was what was the most interesting part of today's session. So thank you all for your feedback um, on that. It looks like um, you know many of you, you know forty over forty percent of you. Are interested in learning about the specific applications of AI and in, in, um, and ML and supply chains? So that's great to hear, um, and then also just just a general knowledge of ML and AI generally. Um, so I don't know, Bhaskar, if you have any thoughts on that, those final poll results, or looks like we and they, they seem to be fairly evenly split. But yeah. but in general, I you know I, again I cannot agree agree more. AI is 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 very topical, um, and. Um, and 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 there are significant there are, there are quite a few use cases that that we can use in supply chain. Uh, so so just be, you know and people are hungry to figure out how we can how we can uh, uh, you know leverage some of these tools to be able to apply. So. Awesome, yeah, absolutely. So maybe I don't know we're running short on time here. So maybe just like one last question that I'll pull from the audience here, and again kind of grouping together a couple of these, and this is a little bit more forward looking type of question. So so Jason has a question of what's like the level of adoption of AI. In supply chain generally, and then I'll also kind of combine that with um, Sinavasan. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your your name correctly, but he's also then asking kind of what the future looks like. What's going to be the impact of these tools? You know, so what's the what's the current level of adoption, and what's the future look like for the impact of these tools on the supply chain um, domain sure. as a professional or as a business? Sure, sure. So, so the current level of adoption is, um, you know. As I said, is is mostly all point based solutions. Um, you know, so uh, there are there are people are using machine learning. People are dabbling with it. People want to use it. There are projects um, all over the place to be able to do it. Uh, but there isn't. There aren't solutions that are kind of designed to address the, the global problem. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and so again, as I listed out, you know, there are, there are there are very specific you know methodologies, collaborative filtering, forecasting techniques, and and others. Um, uh, regression tree-based uh, uh, models that are being applied in, in, in different situations. Um, in terms of um, 
in, in terms of the, the, the future. Uh, once again, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the great thing about, about the, the LLMs and chat GPT is it's just, you know, beyond actually providing the results, it showed what is capable. Right? And that's what is more important. And um, is that, you know, um, that, and then, you know, you can go to the, uh, the AlphaGo and Alpha, AlphaGo Zero in terms of it showed us what a simulation can do. You know, so you know, just for context, AlphaGo Zero was was purely built on on simulated data. There was there was no actual play involved or um, expert knowledge or play involved with it. And so there is a lot that can be done. So having data is great, but but augmenting it and and adding on to it, you know, that can be done externally. You know, through scenario planning and others that can that can provide um, you know allow, allow us to. To, to help better manage some of these changes. So no, I, it's, it is it is pretty bright. Now um, again, there are challenges. You know, I mean, let's not take that take that away. But 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 overall, you know, I, I would um, I would look forward to using those those various tools. Thank you, thank you, Vaskar, because you have shown us the tools, the challenges, the assumptions behind, the limitations. So we've covered so many topics. I know we can go deep on any of and all of all those topics. So hopefully you'll be back and join us again in the future for another webinar series so that we uh, go deeper on those. Uh, thank you to the audience for your engagement. Thank you, Kellen. I don't know if you have any final words for the audience. No, yeah, always a pleasure to co-host with you, Lara. And thank you, Bhaskar, for your timetable. I appreciate your insights. And I know we could definitely go into these topics in a lot more detail. So hopefully we'll bring you back again one day. Absolutely. No, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And for everyone joining us, this is the last webinar wrapping up the summer series. For those that are taking our courses, SE1X, SE3X this fall, or if you are following our SEM webinars, stay tuned because the fall webinar season will start soon. And hopefully we'll get to see you there as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your interest on, your, on our webinar today. See you soon.